Um, welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Uh, it's the 29th of August 2021 and today we have Sheila Jeffries and Marion Rutigliano or Rutigliano. Um, uh, Sheila Jeffries is the author of this book, Unpacking Queer Politics, and here, and uh, uh, she, Sheila and Marion are going to talk about the book and unpack the book, Unpacking Queer Politics. So uh, yeah, I'm sure you know you can chat and we'll put this on YouTube later so you can watch it again if you want to. Okay, um, uh, over to you, Sheila and Marion. Morning, Sheila. This book, 2003, why did you write this book at that time and how was it received at that time? You're on mute, Sheila. At the, at the time, it was very clear because of course I've been involved in feminist politics from the 1970s. It was very clear by 2003 that the queer politics invented by US gay men in the early 1990s were having a very harmful effect on feminism and lesbian feminism. In the early 20th century at that time, and 21st century rather, in the early 21st century, feminism was at a low ebb. There was very little being written about the state of the movement. In the 1980s, early 1990s, there was some feminist writing critical of the politics of gay men, such as Marilyn Fry's wonderful essay in the politics of reality. And there were several chapters in the book, All the Rage from the UK, but there really wasn't anything else that was critical about of what was seen to be a huge takeover and backlash against feminism and lesbian feminism. Uh, the book wasn't noticed at the time, however, uh, in the way that most of my other books have been. There was just a couple of gay men writing angry reviews who, and they didn't like the book at all, as you can imagine, but no feminists seemed to notice it. It was the period of the doldrums as I call it in my autobiography. There was no active feminist movement at the time. The very good thing is, it, is that in the last few years, young, many younger lesbians have been finding the book and they really like it because it explains the politics of queer and the culture in which they are unmeshed and very unhappy. So I'm pleased that the book is coming back in a way or even having a sort of first flush because in 2003, it wasn't really noticed. Yeah, I mean, so those were like the main themes of the book is just queer politics, um, gay male sexuality. What were the, I mean, what were the main yes. themes? Yes. Where did this queer politics stuff come from? And I mean, what was it trying to do? Yeah, in the book, I wanted to show the ways in which gay men's sexual politics were opposed to the interests of lesbians and of women in general. Because a lot of people have thought then, and very many think now, that lesbians and gay men have something in common and should be able to work together with a rainbow flag and so on. Uh, but of course that is not possible because lesbians and gay men are in completely different positions in a hierarchy of power and for many other reasons that I'll talk about today. Um, I explained in the introduction that there was a deep hatred of women embedded in gay male culture. Uh, and I, uh, it could be said, I think, that the hatred of women is fundamental to gay male culture. For instance, drag, the hostile, mocking, parodying of women has always been central to that culture. It still is so. And I think it represents the values of that culture. I talk in the intro about what was called at the time, in some gay men's writings, the ick factor. Now, what was the ick factor? Well, there was a workshop on this at a, a US national gay conference of the National Lesbian and Gay Task Force, which was the main lesbian and gay organization. And it was set up so that gay men could talk about how seeing women's bodies made them feel sick. Uh, gay men would talk about, for instance, seeing women's bodies, lesbian bodies on a beach and feeling that they had to vomit. Now, it's hard to imagine that a workshop at a conference could feature white people talking about feeling sick when they saw black people and so on. Extreme racism isn't acceptable to share in public and wouldn't be expected among people who saw themselves as progressive. But these gay men saw themselves as really radical, really progress, progressive, really in the forefront. So I was surprised, should, but should not have been, to see that visceral disgust at women's bodies. And I do remember 
um, in the early 1980s, when I was involved in politics in my teacher's union, going to a meeting at some men's house, and they were sitting around a table discussing, I went off to the toilet. When I came back, I heard them saying to each other how disgusting it was to hear women urinating. I don't think they heard me, actually, but they were just talking about women's urination because women's bodies were so disgusting to them that they had to talk about it. So I wanted to explain that lack of uh, um, anything in common. And, but otherwise, in the book, there's a chapter on how lesbian feminism rose out of gay liberation and women's liberation. And I show that GLF politics, gay liberation, were pro-feminist. They criticized sex roles such as butch and femme. They criticized sadomasochism and so on. And they were all really different from queer politics. So queer politics was a backlash against that earlier radicalism. And I explained that the theory that sort of came out of queer politics, much of it created by lesbians such as Judith Butler, promoted the idea that queer, which was never well defined, uh, sorry, that gender, which was never well defined, was something that was exciting to play with, whereas feminists said that we actually have to get rid of gender and so on. And in the book, I examine the politics of public sex, said a masochism, the main forms in which gay men's sexuality was expressed at the time, or the forms which they most admired in their culture. I have, but has anything changed with gay men? I mean, think about everything that's happened in the interim, um, AIDS, um, the whole trans thing, and now even some gay men um, getting, you know, irritated or just outright enraged um, about being told that um, their sexuality is not valid. I mean, so has, has that, is that a real thing or has everything, has anything really not changed? I don't think it has. I think gay male politics uh, after gay liberation, I think gay liberation was a little different. So I think the uh, years of the early 70s, there was a lot of criticism of all the things that, that were, became embedded in and, and seen as the, the, the vital parts of gay male sexuality later on. So I, I understand queer politics and gay male politics generally after gay liberation as being about the sexual liberation of gay male sexuality. And it's been very, very problematic for uh, lesbians and feminists because of course, pornography is vital and fundamental to gay male culture. I mean, really, really, really fundamental uh, as is the promotion of prostitution. Prostitution was very often a way that gay men came out and it's been very functional for, for very many gay men. I know there's been a, a few critics, but very, very few gay men don't really speak out against these practices. Pedophilia, for instance, was absolutely promoted in the 1970s in male gay organizations around Europe and in the US. And so I, I don't think that's changed. Let, let, they don't say much about pedophilia now, but about said a masochism, pornography, and all those forms of aggressive hyper-masculinity, those are still fundamental, I think, to gay male culture. And they're certainly not criticized. I, I mean, you talk about like, you know, the way gay male sexuality is constructed. And I, I've always thought it was like, you know, it's, it's based on male socialization. Male sexuality is just sexualized male socialization, but um, is, you know, what is, what is the specific problem of the way gay male sexuality is constructed over and ab above the fact that it's male socialization? It is uh, fundamentally typical traditional gay, uh, the traditional heterosexual male sexuality, of course, that's where it's modeled from. Gay uh, male sexuality comes from the same place, which is that it's the eroticizing of dominance because they're in a power position in relation to women. So male sexuality is constructed out of the power relationship between men and women. And therefore it's about men being able to express their power and aggression and remain in a position of control in relation to subordinates. The problem for gay men is that uh, they um, they often see themselves and are brought up to see themselves as not really masculine because they're not in the male ruling class in as much as they don't subordinate women directly. The difficulty with that is that often gay men grow up with a masochistic sexuality in which they see themselves as therefore some way in, in some way feminine because the femininity and women are the default position. If you're not masculine, you don't make it to the male ruling class, then somehow you're related to women. So a huge swathe of gay male culture and sexuality is about um, talking about their sexuality in terms of men and women, uh, tops and bottoms and feeling like women when they're penetrated. It's about drag, which is mocking women in, in terrible ways. So unfortunately, masochism is very front and central in gay male sexual politics because of this problem 
um, from male supremacy of not seeing themselves as in the dominant class. They, let, they love the dominant class because for the most part, gay male sexuality is, as we'll see later on, about worshipping and loving hyper-masculinity in men. So in that sense, they love the masculinity of the ruling class, but in the sense that they don't see themselves as, as matching up to that often. Yeah, I mean, they got into that whole hyper-masculine thing, and I remember seeing that happen. Um, but, I, you know, all of a sudden there was a jump to queer theory. I mean, you know, did they create hyper-masculinity, you know, yeah. motivated by queer theory, or was it just, you know, they're escaping homophobia, it's all about sex. I mean, where does, you know, how did that hyper-masculine sexuality, you know, where did it come from? How did it jump? Or how did they get to use queer theory? I don't, queer theory obviously came from queer politics. There wasn't queer theory before queer politics developed and queer politics developed in the early 1990s in the US. Um, queer was not a word that was really used much in Britain. It was particularly male and it was particularly US. Um, it, queer politics is usually seen as having developed from the AIDS crisis. Um, gay men uh, it, it were resisting and answering back to the way in which they saw themselves as, as oppressed and discriminated against because of AIDS. So they developed this sort of resistant in-your-face politics of saying we are queer, um, you know, we're here, we're queer, get used to it, all of those slogans and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem was that queer was never really used for lesbians and immediately queer politics developed, lesbians were completely left out and excluded because you know, for decades before the 1990s, we had been struggling as lesbians to get the word lesbian into anything, to ensure that if there was a gay conference, it had the word lesbian there. If there was a book about gay, it had the word lesbian there, because we knew that the generic terms of gay, homosexual, and so on did not cover women. Well, suddenly a, a, a generic term was forced upon us. And what happened quite quickly was that um, something had to be done to describe women who were in this sort of queer lot. And so we were called queer women. Lesbians became queer women because lesbians were obviously not excluded. Um, another term, a descriptor had to be used to explain why there'd been women there at all. So it was a terrible backlash in that sense, in terms of disappearing women and creating a huge promotion in public of the gay male sexual revolution. Uh, I don't think that gay male politics came from there. Uh, gay male sexual politics came from there because, of course, historically, gay male sexual politics have been about um, a, a sort of exaggeration because of course there aren't women women to limit what they're able to do an exaggeration of the politics of male dominant sexuality and joe could you um show a slide for us joe yeah okay so this gives um gives an impression of what was going on this is one of the cartoons of tom of finland Tom of Finland was a Finnish gay man um, from, um, from, from who was involved in the, sorry, who was involved in the war in Finland in the, in the Second World War. And he was in the army and he was gay. He eroticized and says himself, he eroticized the Nazis that he was uh, fighting against. And you can see the man in the middle here has a uh, spread eagle. So it was Nazi unions forms, which he said were extremely sexy. So from the 1950s, 60s, 70s and onwards till his death in 1989, he produced a huge amount of pornography, which was very much based on hyper masculinity. As you can see, it was black leather uniforms and particularly Nazism and Nazi caps. Uh, a lot of it was extremely sadomasochistic groups of men um, beating up and penetrating a man from behind who's tied to a tree. There were um, uh, cartoons of massive penises that were half a length of a man's body and lots of men crowded around worshipping the penis so, because in very, mu in very much it was about a, a phallic cult, a, a cult of the phallus. So this pornography was absolutely huge um, and it's now so popular, it's seen as an art form, it's on mugs in uh, the lanes in the city where I live, alongside Moomin mugs, it's seen as just, you know, what gay is. 
uh, and Marion, you said that you actually remember when this. Oh sort of yeah. Became I mean, I you know I came of age and you know as a young teenager in the West Village in New York City. So I mean, these guys look like millions of other guys that were were just down there. I, they, they were. I mean, I remember seeing them all over the place and in pride parades and and this is you know this is dressed for winter, but I mean they I mean they would just walk around with these like leather jock straps and and little else and it's like. Oh. You know, and it started showing up in pride parades. It was, it was like, yeah, yes, absolutely. I had and my own, the, I had my own ick factor. And it, it was the costumes that, that were in the um, the yeah, village people gross. rock band and so on. Um, yeah, uh, can you take it now down now, Joe? So we don't have to look at this anymore. Um, but yes, it, so sadomasochism and these images were absolutely dominant in gay male culture, and it was about dominance and submission. Now I think this shows a little. It gives a, a good glimpse of why lesbians and gay men don't have a lot in common, because lesbians do not have not created a pornography of um, uh, sex with strangers, uh, sadomasochism in public places, a sort of life size clitoris with a group of lesbians trying to get around it. I mean, this is not thinkable. I mean, you just can't imagine such a thing. Lesbian sexuality and relationships are totally, totally and wholly different because, you know, we don't eroticize masculinity and so on and so on. And nor do heterosexual women. Heterosexual women don't have cartoon pornography with, you know, life size penises. I mean, it's, this is specifically gay male sexuality that comes out of traditional sexuality. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 that and that time and place, you know, the 70s in, in the village in New York City, um, it was like, I call it, you know, one brief shining moment where there really were at the time, um, discrete and separately cohesive lesbian and gay male communities. You know, and if you were there, you got to see, it was like a, a living social experiment. You got to see what happens in terms of sexuality when men have no women to constrain them and when women are completely free of male influences. And the straight men envied the way these gay men were having sex, you know, top and bottom, S and M, um, having sex, you know, ejaculating at least once every day and more than once a day when possible. And each supposed sex act just take a few minutes. The men would consistently make themselves, you know, freely available for sex to other men, no expectation or desire for affection or gentleness. And straight men wanted being with women to be like what the gay men were doing. The lesbians were the polar opposites in every way, right? every way. And, and straight women, you know, looked at this and were envious and wished that being with men was like what lesbians were doing together. Um, so what, you know, and I, you know, of course, you know, male sexuality was going to become the standard for all sexuality because that's what men, gay or straight, want sex to be like. And I get that um, it became the default sexuality in heterosexual relationships because there's a man involved. And you know, as a lesbian, I feel I feel you know bad that heterosexual women have to have to tolerate this. Um, but how did this make the jump to you know? Maybe there's more about how it made the jump to heterosexual sex, but I don't understand. I don't get like how it made the jump to to lesbian sex. I mean, this is how like you know lesbians, um, young lesbians take for granted now aggression, role playing, and all that that seeped in from male sexuality, not just gay male sexuality, but male sexuality. I, I, I just, it breaks my heart. I mean, in the in the late 1980s in California, gay male sexuality really gay male sadomasochism really kicked off politically with the Folsom Street Fair and so on so it became absolutely dominant and some lesbians were involved with gay men in gay male sadomasochist clubs and those lesbians uh, some of whom had considerable histories of abuse like um, Pat Califia for instance who now calls herself Patrick who um, has described how she was beaten every day by her father in childhood. So some lesbians adopted the practices of dominance and submission. And um, the, there was a, a group called Samoa in San Francisco who put out literature. This came into the UK in the early eighties and created lesbian sadomasochism. And it was very, very political, the campaign, which I've described elsewhere in my autobiography and in my book, The Lesbian Revolution. So I don't want to describe that uh, too, in too much detail. But um, I think we were very aware at the time that for lesbians, it was very much connected with uh, sexual abuse and violence that women had suffered. Because as I've explained in, in many places, uh, women, the masochism in women um, is 
quite general because girl children and women uh, do not grow up in a situation of equality. Um, they have sex thrust upon them by men, a, a culture that uh, puts them down. So they're in no position to learn love and sexual relations in a position of anything other than subordination, which is likely to be eroticized in the form of masochism, not for everybody, but for many. So for lesbians, there is that background that many women, if not most, have potentially a masochistic component to their sexuality, and it's hard to get over that. But many of them also had experienced child sexual abuse. For instance, um, uh, Julia Penelope, uh, the wonderful lesbian feminist theorist who's been dead for a while now, but she was writing in the 1980s about having been in her past what was called a stone butch, because in the 1980s, Butch and femme role playing, which had been completely overthrown and rejected by lesbian feminists in the 1970s, came back as a kind of adjunct to sadomasochism. It was a mild form of sadomasochism because, of course, it's the eroticism of a mild um, power difference. And Julia explains that she was sexually abused um, by her father, as a result of which she became a stone butch, meaning that she would not be touched in sexual interactions. She would touch another woman, but she would not be touched in order to try and protect herself and the body that had been abused. And she had learned to dissociate and so, and so on. Um, and she threw all of that off joyfully in the, in the 1970s. And she describes how it was a huge joy that she learned to actually not be a, a stone butch and to have egalitarian relationships with other women. And I think her, her description is very useful for explaining uh, the mechanisms by which lesbians can develop a, a sadomasochist or, uh, orientation. But uh, that's not really the main problem that we're talking about. I mean, the background to all of this is that gay men created and promoted sadomasochism as a cultural form. The effect that it had on uh, lesbian sexuality, I think, I've, I've noticed also was that whereas in the 1970s you could go to a club and lesbians could potentially, if they wished, have one night stands and feel that this was going to be a safe thing to do. I began to find in the 1990s that young lesbians amongst my students would tell me that was no longer really a safe thing to do. They could find themselves in a difficult situation if they just went out uh, to a club and got in, um, took another woman home. So it gradually uh, there was less safety in the relationships between lesbians. It had a, a, an effect. Of course, it's had a huge effect, and I talk about this in my next book, Penile Imperialism, on heterosexual sex, because the promotion of sadomasochism has led to the fact that now anal sex is absolutely central to pornography and to the sex that young women are having to have. And of course, where does that come from? Originally, I would suggest gay male culture. Uh, and many practices of sadomasochism have now been routinely embedded in what's understood as ordinary heterosexuality. So this politics of sadomasochism, the politics of the gay male sexual revolution has had a huge effect upon not just lesbians, but particular heterosexual men and what they now demand. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, straight women, male sexuality now is completely normalized and, and what is considered heterosexual, you know, standard norm, heterosexual um, sex is, is male sexuality. And straight, I mean, it's, you know, some straight women like get that, um, but it's, it must be really painful to see that um, so much of what is normalized is just what men want and, and only what men want. Um, but for women to, you know, who choose to be with men, um, they're stuck having to do that. Um, I, don't, I don't so much understand what's in it for lesbians though, to adopt male sexuality. I mean, unless it's just wanting to have some sense of, you know, um, misplaced sense of empowerment um, that they're somehow uh, dealing with their trauma, which is, I mean, but it does, you know, it obviously doesn't make any sense. They used to say this. I can remember speaking against uh, sadomasochism. I did very much in the 1980s and women sort of standing up in the audience and saying, oh, but the sadomasochism is absolutely great because you can do father uh, dad, you can do daddy sort of, uh, and child, sadomasochism, daddy and daughter, and it enables you to deal with your trauma. 
But of course it doesn't. And as I was, used to say to them, it's just reproducing that trauma and constantly redoing no. it. You can't get off the wheel. What we used to have in the 1970s was incest survivor groups where women would actually try to deal with the trauma and stop it. Whereas sadomasochism was a way of dealing with it that reproduced it. But can I just also say in terms of lesbians trying to imitate this sexuality, uh, it was often, you know, slavish imitation. Back in the 1980s, at the high points of sadomasochism, lesbians used to try to do toilet sex and find that nobody else wanted to do it, you know. Uh, women going into the toilets wanted to have a pee, you know. There weren't little holes in the wall cut out so that lesbians could touch each other's clitorises through the hole or whatever. And there wasn't any of that. But they actually tried to do it and they wrote about how, you know, how what a shame that lesbians were so, you know, repressed. They were unable to do these wonderful things. And another form of male sexuality that they tried to imitate, of course, it was, it was drag, so they tried to do drag kinging and, and so on. And of course, it was a pale imitation and in no way the same. Um, and drag king has not become dominant in culture in the way that RuPaul's drag race has and so on. So yes, a lot of lesbians used to think gay men are the thing because they had the money, they had the power, they had the publications. They were totally dominant in this thing that was supposed to be the lesbian and gay community. And a lot of lesbians did think, yes, we've got to do some of that. Uh, you know, there's a question in the chat about, you know, straight men envying gay men having sex and straight women envying lesbians you know, the way lesbians have sex. And so why do straight men um, hate gay men and straight women often hate lesbians? And I, you know, it may be as simple as just, you hate what you envy but can't have. Um, I, you know, and I remember um, gay men, gay male friends telling me that straight men would come to the, you know, the gay bars um, and get really, really seriously drunk and drugged and everything. So they would, could have sex with the gay men be, and just lament that they wished it was that way with women. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, so here we are in 2021 and what would you have added to the book um, or changed if you had written the book say within the past five years? Well, I think uh, a lot that I would have added to the book, I have put into penile imperialism, which will be my next book. I mean, one of the things that I worry about in, uh, in penile imperialism, where I have chapters on the development of the, the movement to promote paedophilia and the movement to promote sadomasochism and so on, is that readers will think, golly, a lot of this seems to be to do with the politics of gay men. Well, yes, yes, it is. Um, and, you know, I think, God, well, will people say, you know, this is a homophobic book, which is always a possibility. So, um, but so one of the things that I do, for instance, in penile imperialism, and I, I, I was avoiding it in unpacking queer politics. I do remember that at the time of unpacking queer politics, I thought, will I do paedophilia? I made a decision not to. I mean, it, when I wrote the book in Australia, um, what was happening was that there was the exp an exposure of the way in which powerful gay men, um, the judges, mayors and others were involved in the sexual abuse of boys. Uh, and there was a wood, com the wood, wood Commission took place, which looked into the way that police related to gay men and paedophilia and so on. And there was a fascinating evidence came out of that. I remember that there was there had been a gay male holiday camp on the New South Wales coast and one of the um, uh, those giving evidence to the Wood Commission said that he was 14 when he was there and he heard the screams coming from nearby where men were using boys at that time. It was a very, very, very big scandal that many men who were sort of in the establishment were involved in this. But at the time, lesbians said it would be homophobic to mention it, homophobic to criticize it. You couldn't talk about it. And so though I was very aware and I kept all of the clippings and I knew what was going on, I chose not to put that in unpacking queer politics. Now, of course, in penile imperialism, I do have a whole chapter and I explain how in the 1970s in the UK, um, the, the uh, books, uh, groups like you know, what became Liberty uh, uh, and so on, had paedophile groups in their membership and were happy with them. Whole swathes of the left accepted paedophilia. In Holland, the main gay male organization had paedophile porn in the 40s and was certainly pro it in 1980 and so on and so on. It was, huge. It was a huge push 
to legalize sex with boys. Absolutely massive. And gay men could not understand what the problem was with that. Very many gay men. The, the interesting thing is that though many gay men will say it was only a small number, it was only a small number, they didn't criticize it. You never got critiques and, and powerful gay men would just assume that it was a part of gay male uh, liberation and so on. So I, I, I would have put that, except I guess I was slightly put off at the time and thought, you know, it's gonna be very tricky to cover this. I have covered it at last. Um, and of course, um, the, the, the problem now is that gay men are, have not criticized until very recently, they're just beginning to criticize the politics of gender identity um, and gay male organizations um, have very much been promoting this politics. I have to say that there was reluctance. I can remember in the early 2000s seeing online discussions about the politics of transgenderism in the US because um, transvestites, heterosexual male cross-dressers were trying to get their concerns into gay organizations and gay organizations were re rejecting that. They were not allowing it to happen. They were saying, this will give us a bad reputation. It's really not a good idea to be allied with this cause. That was all overwhelmed because of course, you know, by, by 2014 Stonewall in the UK has taken up the cause. It had already been taken up by organizations in the US. And there were almost no um, demurring left. The gay men were not criticizing it. So I do think that we, we get the politics of um, transvestism attached to gay male organizations because drag is already there, because of this idea of the, the female default and the, 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 the way that femininity is treated in gay male culture. I think that's way the why these heterosexual men were able to latch on. And there was very little uh, response to it. So gay men have been a powerful force, which I think has been little criticized, even though they've supported pornography, prostitution, sadomasochism, paedophilia, drag, and so on. Um, very, very few feminists, very few lesbian feminists ever mention it. I think it's because the assumption is we'll all get um, attacked in the same way. The general public thinks lesbians and gay men do have something in common and are in some way alike. And so it's too dangerous to criticize gay men. That is all that I can think because there has just been so little critique, even though they're very, very powerful culturally, in politics, in business, gay men are now very powerful against yeah. the interests of women I, I very mean, often. I can understand, you know, having lived through all this, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s and, and, and so on, I can understand why, um, you know, gay male sexuality why it was easier for them to just push it into, um, you know, lesbian sexuality. I mean, we shared a lot of the same, you know, political organizations fighting for, you know, basic rights in the beginning. Um, but it, it, I, I remember, you know, we thought the 70s would last forever, and then we got into the 80s and the 90s. And I remember when the magazine On Our Backs first came out. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, we're all young lesbians. And so I, I bought it, and my girlfriend and I looked at it because we were told it was, yeah, it was going to be about lesbian sex. And, you know, young lesbians want to read about lesbian sex. And we looked at it, and we're like, uh, what is this? And we thought, this is what, you know, we figured, okay, this was just their, their first issue. And why were they, like, promoting this stuff? Because it was all S and M, there was no BDSM, then it was S and M. B and D was separate than S and M, um, and 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 that's what it, what it was all about. And we thought, like, well, all right. So we bought the second issue, thinking, all right, hopefully it'll it'll be better. And it wasn't. It was all the same stuff, and it was horrible. It was awful. Um, and the third issue, we didn't buy. I mean, we just thumbed through it and said, okay, this is what this is about. Um, and and it was just, you know, we just tossed it aside, thinking. Well, this will never last. Nobody will buy it. Who's, who wants to, you know, who wants to read about this? No, no lesbian's going to be into this. Um, and we were wrong. And there was, you know, a lot of the things you talk about in the book, a lot of the events I lived through, and we kind of knew that us uh, didn't feel right, but we didn't put it together. I mean, we really didn't. Were there women who were putting it together at the time? Was that, you know, um, understanding that the personal was political? Was that part of putting it together? I mean, how did, you know, who was like, who was putting it together at the time when most of us were just feeling like, oh my God, this is wrong, but it's so screwed up. Who's going to be into it? I mean, who, 
You're talking about the 80s here, Marion, yes? 80s, 80s and into the 90s, yeah. Yeah. On our backs, I think, was uh, mid-80s. And yes. I can remember also being horrified to see it. Uh, because it was uh, it was an anti-lesbian feminist backlash. It was absolutely direct. It was a new politics, um, a pornographic uh, politics, uh, which were uh, completely against feminism. Because, of course, as you know, at the time, there was uh, a very important feminist magazine in the States called Off Our Backs. Right. So the women who put out On Our Backs, many of whom it became clear, because I was really trying to work out what was happening with these magazines, had been in the sex industry. They'd been prostituted. Um, and they, they chose as their, their slogan, there's, um, there's, uh, they, said they, they made themselves On Our Backs, which meant you know, it was the opposite of Off Our Backs, so the opposite of feminism. And there was, a, there was an important slogan in the Women Identified Woman paper, which was a, a lesbian feminist um, very important document from uh, 1970 or so. Um, and in that, there's this wonderful phrase, um, um, lesbianism is the rage of all women, meaning at our, at our oppression, condensed to the point of explosion. A wonderful, wonderful, strong phrase. In On Our Backs, it was changed into, in their publicity, Lesbianism is the lust of all women condensed to the point of explosion. So instead of political change and rage at the oppression of lesbians and women, it was about all we need to do is have the pornography and lesbianism is just about the pornography and the pornographic sex. So yes, that was, that was all happening in the mid eighties, but certainly here, and I don't know, can't imagine it wasn't happening to some extent in the States. We had a massive response to that in 1984. We formed in London, the group uh, Lesbians Against Sadomasochism. We'd already had a group called Lesbians Against Pornography, and we fought the development of lesbian sadomasochism. And we did put it all together. We explained how all of this fitted into male violence against women and male sexuality and what it meant for feminism and the oppression of women. We definitely did that. Um, and we were writing and speaking about it very much in the 1980s. Here in the States, I mean, Women were, and Rita Mae Brown pointed it out that um, a lot of women, um, you know, in women's liberation, straight and, and, and lesbian, um, started having professional lives, settling down, moving to the suburbs, pursuing the arts, um, you know, and anything except political action. Um, but, you know, the um, male sexuality, you know, starting with gay male sexuality, just became like, um, like these like tentacles percolating through everything. Um, and, you know, uh, someone in the chat mentioned, um, you know, beauty, you know, standards of beauty and that so much of, um, what's, of what straight women have to have to tolerate sexually came from this gay male sexuality, but everything else in, in so many women's lives are, are gay male standards of what is pretty, beautiful, sexy. I mean, look at the models in, in beauty pageants and look at the models in, you know, in, in advertisements um, that, are, that are promulgated as just being attractive. These, you know, skinny, 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 no hips, you know, squared off shoulders. Um, the, the very um, characteristics of what, you know, what was called a twink, you know, a hairless young gay man very youthful looking and that's what that's what models were supposed to be that's what straight women models were supposed to be as the ideal of beauty um so it just it just permeated its way into um into heterosexual sexuality into, into what heterosexual women were told they were supposed to be as well um but you know what so all, all this you know has happened um, what, what can we do about it for women in general, for lesbians in particular, to try and build a pathway out of all this damage done by queer theory? Well, I think, I, I, I do think that women are, young lesbians in particular, but feminists are speaking back. Now, as somebody in the chat did say, Kate asked, you know, maybe we should say something more about queer theory. So uh, we've got a revolt against queer theory now 
taking place. So if I could just say a little bit more about queer theory. Uh, queer theory and queer politics were not obviously connected or joined at the hip because uh, queer politics was about action, doing actions and being in your face and so on. Um, that developed first. Queer theory developed later and um, gave a sort of theor theoretical background to a lot of these uh, practices. Uh, for instance, uh, Judith Butler argued and other queer theorists argued that if you transgressed a gender, uh, in other words, if uh, a lesbian was butch or if a gay man did drag, and so on. That was, that was the revolution in itself. That was all you needed to do. You didn't have to have demonstrations on the streets or try to create legislative change. All you needed was to make everybody suddenly realize what the whole system was about by wearing different clothes. I mean, which was an absurd idea. But also underlying that idea is the idea that gender, um, you know, that everybody has a gender and that gender is revolutionary and so on. And that, though, so the queer theory really justified and became the basis for the politics of transgenderism by saying that this, that gender was so revolutionary. Um, but everybody, I mean, one, which of I mean, queer theory, you know, one of the classical things about it or one of the fundamentals about it is that it is transgressive or it's supposed to be transgressive um but you know it has come to be not so much conflated but really genuinely um um a part of it has come to just be misogyny um queer theory really just started out as transgressive judith butler you know gender is bad but you can deal with it by just playing with it you know just playing around with it um but but Queer theory, as it's been adopted now, has just become a vehicle um, for more, more and more vicious misogyny um, and, and lesbophobia in particular. I, I mean, I like the idea of to deal with it of, um, of what consciousness raising groups used to do. It wasn't therapy. CR was not therapy. CR was, you know, women talking about, I experienced this. Um, and it was like just women and there was no judgment. And women found out that almost every other woman experienced the same things that they did and felt the same way about it as they did um and it was it was just transformative for so many women which which i think is one of the reasons why you know men don't want us to talk to each other unsupervised anymore um because something powerful like that may happen again it, it will happen it will happen yeah, yeah I, I mean yeah can yeah. i just say something because you did say something about personal is political so if i could just talk about that sure. for a moment and of course the personal is political, which, which went with consciousness raising, of course, which is where you talked about your experience, realized that other women had this experience, that it was not individual experience, but actually political, because it was the experience of women as a class. Uh, the idea of the personal is political came out of that. And it was an understanding that, you know, it was very different from the traditional left, which was, you know, factory gate stuff and, and so on in the workplace. The personal is political. Um, understood, said that what goes on in your head, uh, the way that you feel sexually, the fantasies you may have in your head, the clothing that you put on your body, the way that you hold your body, whether you have to hold your legs together because you have no power or whether you can spread your legs, the whole way that you think, feel and clothe yourself is actually political. And for women, it's constructed out of the power relationships of male domination. Now, it was revolutionary in being able to, uh, for us, because we knew that if sexuality was constructed by politics, as we understood that it was, it could change. So we knew gay male sexuality was not inevitably take, to take the form that it did, that we could require change and it could change. Um, and indeed, in terms of sexual fantasies, for instance, in the early 1980s, we used to do um, anti-sadomasochist workshops at women's conferences because sadomasochism was coming in. And one of the arguments was, well, you know, women just are masochistic. If these fantasies in, the, in your head, then that's who you are. You are a sadomasochist. You need to get into it. Nothing can change. It's who you are. 
And so we used to have these workshops at conferences. Um, and one of the things that we did was to say, um, now anybody want to say what um, one of their sexual fantasies is? Um, and some brave women would say things and we'd, and we'd all fall about laughing. The important thing being that laughter is a wonderful breath of fresh air. It's a disinfectant. Laughter is a sexual disinfectant, really. If you think about the atmosphere in gay clubs and things where the gay men and don't even speak, let alone laugh, and they get fed up if lesbians go to them because the lesbians come in and they laugh and they destroy the whew, atmosphere that is necessary for the sexuality of dominance and submission that they're doing. So we used to laugh at these fantasies uh, on the grounds that women, it would, it would disinfect them and, and women would no longer be able to find them really exciting. So we talked about all of those things, like what goes on in our heads, what created this, what, how to deal with it. That sort of thing is all gone. Nobody really talks about those kind of things anymore. And, and I think there's still, there's a, there's a, We've gone back to the old acceptance in a way that lesbianism is biological, that butch and femme is biological, that these things are not politically constructed and cannot be changed. Uh, I, and again, um, circling back to CR groups, because there's been um, this chat about it, um, I think that that was valuable also in, in, um, in, in, in combating the tendency towards this individualism because you you saw yourself as part of the oppressor oppressed class because every other woman had the same experiences so when you see groups of men you know um the army you know sports teams things like that there is there is a culture um they are the oppressor class um and yet they are you know teaching each other in this like very very cohesive kind of male bonding ritual group thing um, that you individually, you know, can be, can be the star, you the man. Um, men perform well in sports when they're told that everything depends upon them and it'll all fall apart if they don't rise to the challenge. It's very, very individualistic. When women are allowed to just toss the men out and talk day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year in CR groups and see that they are part of, um, of the whole group of women. They are part of the class of women. Their experiences are common. Um, the, the dynamic is completely different. And, and I think women, if they do that, are more prepared to understand why the personal is political. And I think that losing that is why um, women became so susceptible. So many women became susceptible to saying, oh, I can just choose whatever I want. Uh, because they don't understand anymore that they're still in a jail. Marilyn Try talks about being, you know, you see like this one, this one bar and it's in front of you and it doesn't seem like a big deal. And then you look a little bit to the right and there's another bar. Um, and that's all you see because it's just right up against your face. And what you don't see is what people see from the outside is that you're in a cage and the whole, and there's bars all around you and you can't get out. Um, and what CR did, um, what, what women bonding did as the oppressed class was understand that that cage was all around them um, and that every single decision they were making, every single decision was in the context of being in that cage. Um, you know, m men don't have that. It's a completely different dynamic. Yes, and it, I, I think it's particularly significant in the area of sexuality because I think very many women are trapped into thinking that what sexual fantasies they have, what may sometimes turn them on in their heads, particularly in the middle of the night or what they may dream or whatever, is somehow who they are and that is their sexuality. Um, and I, I, I used to talk to students about this because I knew that many of them as they were you know, coming into their sexual, sexual lives would be having some of these problems. And I said that, you know, that, that there is this big problem that there is just the concept of sexual pleasure, sexual having a sexual reaction and it not being pleasurable was not really well understood. But of course, uh, women in, in prostitution and pornography can somehow have um, orgasms as a reaction to friction and feel terrible about it because it was something they really, really didn't want. And I would explain to my students that they might have um, a supposedly erotic dream, but they may wake up and they may feel the next morning really not very nice because actually it was about subordination and it, with the politics of it were, were pretty dreadful. 
risk. And of course, I talked about how we can change this, but we also need to change the language. So we talked about, and it all came from consciousness raising and the stuff that you're talking about. We talked about how there needed to be a word that wasn't sexual pleasure for when um, sexual responses happened that didn't make you feel good at all. Um, and that the erotic was not a sufficient word for what was going on. Uh, so, and I think at the time somebody did suggest, I can't remember who it was now, that we could use the word dysrotic, meaning something that made you have a sexual response, which in theory is supposed to be wonderfully positive because in this culture, sexual response is supposed to make women complicit and it's what they really want and so on, but how it's possible to have a sexual response and for that to have a very negative consequence. So. Dysrotic is potentially a term for describing that. But this sort of detailed, nitty gritty, getting down into what does make women have sexual responses, both in sadomasochism, in, in butch and femme, in responses to the appearance of other women, this stuff is just really not talked about now, certainly not talked about politically. And of course, I hope that the whole new wave that is happening now will take us back to the point uh, where you this is possible oh dysrotic somebody's saying how do you spell dysrotic uh, I think that would be d-y-s-r-o-t-i-c or at least I always spelt it in that way so yes I I hope that we get back there I mean one of the things that you asked earlier Marion is what do we do to deal with queer um, and uh, and what I didn't quite say, but uh, but um, is that actually I see online lots of young lesbians and feminists really criticizing Judith Butler. That never used to used to happen. Never used to. She was absolutely dominant in the universities. All essays in the social sciences had to mention her. She was the queen because, of course, she totally serves male dominance. You don't get that sort of coverage and 17 books about you and prizes without serving male dominance. That, that's obviously the case. But I see women criticizing her now and being angry and I'm hoping that these young women will start to, to move back into the really profound and deep critique that we used to have of women's experience, of lesbian experience, of um, the way that women's sexuality is constructed because it's revolutionary to change the sexual furniture in your head. Yeah I'm seeing lots of discussions about dysrotic and deep DYS, think of dysrotic dystopia, you know, DYS means dis, um, you know, um, not as in dissing someone, but as like a bad thing. Um, my, um, my, one of my concerns is, is that the, um, you know, there, there's like, you know, studies and it's in the news that, that all of a sudden within the past five years, there's far less uh, approval and far less um, affection for the LGBTQ or at least the LGBT. Um, and there's, you know, they don't break it down and specifically ask about each letter in particular. It's just the LGBT. And, you know, you gotta wonder if it's not all really because of the T. Um, so we are expecting, anticipating, and I would not be surprised if there was a backlash against the LGB part of that, that um, disastrous LGBT conglom conglomeration. Um, I hope that it, and, but, but I, you know, I think it's it's going to not be not be good for the LGB. Um, I think it'll be particularly bad for the L. Um, the T is starting to sort of woo the G to kind of keep them in the fold and keep their financial support, and you know, and, and maybe not get down on them so heavily. Um, but my concern is is that the this backlash, which is somebody notices, is really already starting to happen, um, is going to take us to. Uh, um, to a, a time in the past. And I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing because it is worse now than it was 50. I came out 51 years ago and it is worse now in many ways than it was back then. Back then, especially for lesbians, but for you know women in particular, CR groups and things, we at least had refuge and sanctuary. We had all women's spaces. We had completely lesbian spaces that you could absolutely boot a man out of and he'd have no recourse. Um, so. Um, you know, if the backlash takes us back 51 years, um, you know, that might not be so bad. And yes, I realize somebody's saying that's for the USA, um, but for non-English countries, I know it, it, it would be horrible. Um, so 
where do you see the, the possibility of that backlash, at least in places like the US, the UK, maybe Australia? Um, how do you, do you think we can use that? Um, or how do you think that that will um, affect how we, uh, how we can get out of this, you know, like horrible, um, you know, thing of, of male sexuality and, you know, invading um, our, our lives? Yes, well, the problem is that I do think that the backlash will be against lesbians and gay men together because we are seen as having something in common. So what we used to do in the old days was we had a totally separate lesbian movement, culture, community with our own values, our philosophy, our ethics, our totally different politics. That doesn't exist now. There's been a huge backlash against lesbians. Lesbians no longer use the word lesbian. They have no facilities and no spaces. So we have to build that again. We have to get out of the LGBT and say every single time we see it and every single time we see the dreadful rainbow flag, flag we have nothing to do with that. We are women who love women. We are lesbians and we're completely, completely separate. And that's where our energies have to go because only by trying to build in the public mind and for everyone how separate we are and we have nothing to do with these politics, is there any possibility of us not suffering the same backlash? But it, I think it is a danger. Um, somebody asked in, in the Q&A about, you know, um, what, uh, what feminist theorists would you like to see recovered and taught again in the academy? Well, they're all the ones that I always that talk about. Julia Penelope, for instance, who I talked about earlier, who gave those, those wonderful understandings of how child sexual abuse can affect sexuality. Um, I think Julia Penelope, obviously. Uh, I think um, Kate Millett, obviously. Um, Andrea Dworkin, uh, Adrian Rich. All of these people who would never normally be seen as suitable for any courses in universities. When I taught at the university in Melbourne, there were no, it, the, the um, women's studies department, which became gender studies, of course, to include men, uh, was on the same floor. They were in our same school. Uh, they, of course, never taught me in their sex and power course, and they never taught any radical feminists or lesbian feminists whatsoever. So, it, it's difficult to imagine how we are going to, to incorporate any of this. But I think one positive thing I can say is that when I got a job at the University of Melbourne in 1991, it was because students called for feminism and lesbian feminism. They demanded it. And so I was brought in to teach it. They had to set up a position and bring me in. Now we just have a, a, a political, a theoretical climate in universities, very, very hostile to feminism. But students may again demand proper feminism and it's possible that there could be therefore a better future. I mean, I very seriously hope so. I know there are some young feminist scholars out there who have, are doing wonderful work and could take these places in universities and do all this marvelous teaching. Some of them are. So uh, I, I think there's a, there has to be a note of hope in here. Um, someone in the chat was, I mean, we've been talking in the chat about um, women, you know, in non-English speaking um, in the rest of the world. I mean, I started with the US, the UK, Australia, because that's what I know um, the most, but um, it is even more horrific um, for women in virtually all the rest of the world. I mean, it really is. Um, you know, if if we make things different where we are, will that help them? Is there something else that we can be doing? You know, I mean, it's it's like it's like a huge question. Um, but um, and there's also the role of um, of you know religions um, in the in the rest of the world. Um, all the Abrahamic religions um, being particularly misogynistic. Um, it, what what do we do for women in the rest of the world? Well, one um, of the things we need to do, and I can't see it happening any time soon, is turn the lesbian and gay organizations back onto what should really be their task, which is fighting for lesbians and gay men against oppressive laws and the uh, impositions of religion and against systems under which they are suffering. And But of course, they're not doing that. To get funding, they've taken up um, transvestite male heterosexual masochism and their sexual rights, uh, and they're not doing any of this crucially important work, it seems now. 
So, uh, uh, of course, transvestism is just a terrible diversion from what should be the purpose of these organizations and what I once understood to be the purpose of these organizations. I mean, they, they say, well, you know, lesbians and gay men have got many of the things they wanted now, like ghastly gay marriage, which is something that gay men really competed, for, uh, challenged and campaigned for and lesbian feminists completely, completely opposed because of course marriage is the foundation of, of the way women are oppressed in heterosexuality. Um, but um, les uh, these lesbian and gay organizations need to go back to fighting the oppression of lesbian and gays in the rest of the world, if they think they have what they want. And of course, you know, lesbians have nothing <laughs> pretty much even in the West now, nothing of their own. But if these lesbian and gay organizations think there's nothing to fight for, because they're not going to fight for lesbians, they should at least put their concentration on what is happening in Uganda and in Thailand and in South Africa and so on. And they might find they got funding. They might find that people cared if they actually did what they were set up to do. Well, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's time. Um, we could go on. We could go on all day. You know, you know we could. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Sheila. Um, wonderful to talk with you again. Yes, you um, too. I have over the years uh, um, given that book to a lot of people. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.